the last year, we did see these uh, community forums. We came up to Dare County, really miss seeing you in person, but it is still hurricane season, so we don't wanna let our guard down and we're gonna do it virtually this year. A couple folks joining us today. We have a big, big team. Drew Pearson, of course, is the director of emergency county management uh, in Dare County. James Wooten is the planner for the county. I'm the warning coordination meteorologist, just a fancy term for a meteorologist that does a lot of community outreach. Mike Lee is down at our office in Moorhead City. He's gonna help us with some of the background and Q&A session. And then Andrew and Liam, uh, there are paid interns this summer um, they go to Penn State and Miami. You can see they've been a, a big, big help. Unfortunately, with the situation going on, they can't be with us in person, but they've helped out a lot. Uh, they're going to help with the Q&A session at the end. So really appreciate uh, everybody on the team joining us. Some tech things. Your microphones have been muted. One of the reasons we're doing this over the internet is we do not have to worry about background noise. So just kind of sit back and uh, watch the presentation. If you have a question, if you're just logging on and if you missed it in the beginning, we want your input. We want your questions. We want a discussion. You can do it a couple of different ways. You can ask it through the webinar itself. Nobody's going to see the question except our team here. So don't be embarrassed about a question. Don't think there's something you can't ask. Please go ahead and ask it. The other way you can do it is you can raise your hand. And I'll say probably hold off until the end for that because we're going to do the Q&A at the end. Uh, but you just click on the raised hand feature um, and then we'll call on you. We'll unmute your microphone and you can ask the question verbally. So please, um, you know, consider doing that as well. And again, it's this feature right up here. You're just going to raise your hand um, and then we'll unmute your microphone and you can ask that question verbally. If you don't have a mic, um, again, most smartphones or mobile devices do have that, but if you don't have a microphone, just ask it through the webinar uh, itself. So that's it for the housekeeping on the presentation. I'm gonna turn things over to Drew Pearson. Um, he's gonna uh, start things off. He's gonna present, uh, and then throw it back to me, um, and then again, stick around for the um, Q&A session at the end. Really, really appreciate you joining us uh, today for this very important information. So without further ado, Drew, it is all yours. And again, just lead me uh, with the slides you want to jump to. Hey, great, Eric, and thank you. I, got, I just got to say thank you to the National Weather Service. Uh, when I reached out to Eric about hosting a virtual community forum, he said, we got it, we can do it. We got the software, we got the technology. We would much rather have our weather service partners here with us in Dare County. Uh, so you can ask those questions one on one, but with the current threats that we have with COVID, this is the best way to get the information out. Um, we're using the technology the Weather Service has. It's a great tool, but if there are stumbles, uh, we'll work through them and we'll get your questions answered as best we can. But thank you for all joining us uh, from across Dare County. It's good to have you with us. I'm here at the Dare County EOC. And uh, Eric, if you can go to the next slide, please. This is uh, get ready, everybody. Next slide is uh, up for you talks about the seasonal forecast for the hurricane season. It's a busy season already. We're uh, already been through eight named storms. There's a potential tropical storm out in, in the Caribbean right now. Who knows what that's going to be other than Eric Hayden. You can ask him about that later. But I just share this number of storms and the seasonal forecast with you to share. Don't, don't focus on this busy season or not busy season. We still got to get ready. That it only takes one storm to devastate a community, and that storm could be here today, tomorrow, the next day, whatever it might be. So we need to get ready now for any storm that may come our way. Next slide, Eric. Help you get ready. There's seven simple things you can do. Uh, I'll talk about them in this slide, but I'll also add a little bit more detail as we uh, go through the presentation. But the first item is determine your risks. And when I say risk, uh, most of you uh, that are residents of our county have been here for a while, even our new residents, know that there is a flood map zone that determines your risk for hurricane insurance purposes. That's a great, great piece, but you also need to know that there are other risks than flooding that could occur. Life-threatening storm surge is a key problem. It, it could be challenging and devastating. We could have tornadoes. We could have uh, inland flooding that may not allow us to get commodities moving back and forth. We can see ocean conditions that bring life threatening rip currents before, during, and after a storm. So you need to really know what your risk is 
and be ready to adjust to it. And then in the county, the entire county is a hurricane evacuation area. So the um, you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan for that hurricane evacuation. I will say that um, in the county, we now have hurricane evacuation zones. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. We've always had them, but now they're a little bit more formal. And they'll, I'll give you more details on that. There's a no new zone initial, initiative. But in your plan, start thinking about what you're going to do, where you're going to go, and how you're going to get there. Uh, this year, as we manage the storm in a hurricane environment with COVID associated with it, you really need to think about where you're going to go. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are already got those plans in mind, but revisit those. Get that plan, that hurricane evacuation plan in place. Know what you're going to do. This year, uh, really focus on finding some place where you can go, bring your pets with you, you can take your family with you, and you're going to be safe with friends, safe at another location, maybe a hotel. Please, please, please do not rely on a shelter. You should never rely on a shelter as your last resort, but please make your plans now so you have some place to go. If you have visitors coming into town this summer, call them up and go visit with them uh, should we have an evacuation placement. Get those plans in place. Sheltering is going to be different this year. I, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but there is going to be different terms. There's going to be congregate and non-congregate sheltering, and there's going to be things that are different this year as we work to protect everybody during this COVID hurricane season. And please remember, we do not have pre-storm shelters in, in Dare County. So your plans need to have a place to go. Get it in place now. Think about it. Get it laid out. Know where you're going to go. And try not to rely on the shelter. But I'll move on to the next item. Uh, let's get your disaster kit ready. No, Eric, go back. I'm sorry. Um, but number three is the assembly of disaster supplies. I'll talk a little bit more details in another slide about what you need to have in those kits, but your kit needs to include those things for a COVID environment, hand sanitizers, masks, cleaning supplies, but get those things ready. Make sure you have everything you need for your family, your pets, your medicines, all of that stuff, and get your disaster kits put together. Next one is uh, get an insurance checkup. Um, it's never too late until you're, um, have to file the claim, get your insurance checked up. If you have flood insurance, if you don't, think about getting it now. There is waiting periods to get that in place, uh, to, to at least 30 days, a lead time before it's an effective policy. But get your insurance policies checked up, your homeowners, make sure you got all those documents, make sure everything's good to go, everything's set. So make sure you have your, your personal things covered with the insurance that you, you need. The next one, Eric, I'm sorry, Eric, I'm sorry, I'm not, my apologies, Eric. The next item is strengthen your home and help your neighbor. And I do ask everybody to take a look around their, their home, make sure that the doors are working properly, the uh, uh, yard is cleaned up, that you've trimmed the trees, that you're, you've got, if you don't have shutters that close automatically, that you have the wood that you're able to get up to cover your windows. Take care of your home now to get it ready for a potential storm. And I ask you to look after your neighbors as well. Uh, see what the neighbors need help with. If there's elderly people in your neighborhood, make sure you're ready to help them out. Get ready by getting your house ready and keeping an eye on your neighbors. I'll talk a little bit more about something you can do for your neighbors in, in a future slide. And I also ask you to know your trusted sources of information. For me, it's the National Weather Service, whether it's the Hurricane Center or our great partners down at Newport Moorhead City, our trusted sources of information. Know who those are and who you're going to turn to. Uh, make sure you're signed up for Dare County Alerts. I'll give you a little more information about that in a minute. And I do ask you to complete a written hurricane plan. Write it down now while you're not under pressure. Know what you're going to do, where your things are, where your documents are, where your hurricane kit is, where you're going to go. Have that written down so when you need to execute it, and if you're under pressure, you can turn to that written plan and, and pull it out and, and get to it. And share that plan with your loved ones. Uh, but, you know, it's, if you're going somewhere and your family's not here, or they're somewhere else and they're worried about you, let them know where you're going to be so they can get in touch with you and stay in contact throughout a, an evacuation or throughout the hurricane. Now it's the next slide, Eric. Thank you. I mentioned earlier the hurricane zones that we now have, evacuation zones, statewide across North Carolina. We have a new initiative that's in place now. It's called Know Your Zone. You can find more details out about it at knowyourzonenc.gov. In their county, we have Zone A, which is Hatteras Island. 
zone A, which is all of Hatteras Island. And then we have zone B, which is the rest of the county. As we message evacuations, we will use our zone terminology, but we will continue to say, we're evacuating Hatteras Island to include the villages and all the ones that are included. The same up north, we're evacuating zone B to include the towns, all of the areas that are incorporated that, that need to be shared. We'll continue to message it that way, but you may see in press releases and other things that come out from the state where the zone is mentioned. So knowing your zone is a great initiative. It's been ongoing in the state for a while. It's being implemented this year, and there's a lot of great information on the Know Your Zone NC.gov website to include a lookup tool that you can go into and determine by your address, whether you're zone A or B, which you should know already. But if you don't, you can do that. It'll give you what zone you're in and a lot of other great information. New tool this year implemented by our state for all the coastal communities in North Carolina. And it's uh, it's there for you, a, a resource and something that we'll be using this year to message our zone evacuations. Next slide, Eric. I mentioned having an evacuation plan and I, I hope you realize I'm being redundant here because it's really important to have that evacuation plan. The Ready NC app gives you some information, the Ready NC website that you see on the left-hand side, but also on the right-hand side, just remember life-threatening storm surge, flooding, and high winds, they don't care about having COVID out here. You need to really think about those things that are gonna impact your life and, 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 and take the precautions to protect yourself from COVID as you make those decisions and execute your evacuations plan. I did mention that uh, uh, there is going to be some differences. You may hear the term reception center, reception center being used. It may come up and you may be told to go to a reception center location. If that is being used, you'll go to that location. You'll get a medical screening, to do a temperature check, make sure you're not exhibiting symptoms of COVID. And you may be assigned to a congregate shelter, which would be your typical uh, large a gymnasium, a school, or a church, or you may be assigned to a non-congregate shelter, which could be a dormitory or a motel type setting. So those are the things that are being used this year to help uh, reduce the spread of COVID as we go through this challenging season this year. But make sure you have your stuff, your kit, everything you need. When you get to a shelter this year, if you have to go to one, you may not have, they may not provide cots, they may not provide hot meals, it's going to be a much more uh, demanding environment in a shelter. It's going to be safe, but less amenities, more self-reliance. So I truly do encourage you to make your plans now and make those plans that do not include a shelter. Okay, Eric, next slide, please. I mentioned uh, getting your kit ready. Uh, we are going to be practicing in three W's throughout this hurricane season. Uh, there's, uh, I, I doubt that's going to change. So make sure you. Add those uh, face coverings, hand sanitizers, and cleaning supplies to your kit so you can take them with you so wherever you go. You may need them. You'll especially need them if you end up in a shelter. But the emergency kit supply list is available at uh, readync.org, and uh, it can help you uh, get that kit properly stocked for this hurricane season. Eric, next slide, please. I mentioned the uh, readync.org. This is their website on the Left hand side, a lot of great information there. It's readync.org. Uh, for those of you that have downloaded the ReadyNC app in the past and have that on your phone, that app has been uh, discontinued. So I encourage you to go to the readync.org website, bookmark it on your mobile device. The same information that's available on the app will be available at the website. Uh, to include where there are open shelters, where the reception center might be. So please, uh, Ready NC app has been discontinued. Everything that was doing in the past is now on their website or readync.org and bookmark the mobile version on your mobile device. So you have that information available to you should you have to evacuate. Next slide, please, Eric. I mentioned earlier, as I was talking about getting your home ready and get things straightened out, uh, helping your neighbors out. We have a great program here in Dare County. It's our special medical needs registry. This uh, video, uh, for those folks that uh, have been here for a while, you'll notice there have been some personnel changes in the video, but the message is still the same. 
And Eric, I'm going to ask you to play the video now, if you could, so people get an understanding of what the special medical needs registry is. I'm Melanie Horfrey with the Dare County Department of Health and Human Services, and I oversee the social services division that is responsible for maintaining the special medical needs registry for Dare County residents. The registry is for anyone with a chronic disease, serious medical condition, physical disability, terminal illness, or someone that uses medical equipment to aid mobility. The special medical needs registry does not have to be specific to the elderly population in Dare County. It can also be for disabled adults in Dare County as well. If they have a physical disability, we can serve them and assist them with evacuation. Anyone who uses oxygen and or who needs dialysis is strongly encouraged to complete the information to be placed on the registry, as those are two critical needs if the power goes out for an extended time period and or access is limited where the person lives after the event. A couple of the things that we talk to our, our registrants about is that we want to make sure that they know that if they're on medications, making sure that they have enough medications if they're going to leave the county and are not allowed to come back to the county for several days. And any other family members who need to be aware, neighbors, if they have pets, any anything like that. If they need important documents that they need to take with them, we remind them of those things. Any medical equipment, if they have a cane, a walker, those types of things, we make sure that they know that they need to take those things with them. When a storm is approaching and the emergency operations center is activated, special medical needs coordination begins. Based on information you have provided, arrangements will be made for you. If you are bed bound and require around the clock care, you may be evacuated by an ambulance to a special medical needs shelter. Individuals who require dialysis and or oxygen will be evacuated to a place where those services can be obtained. Someone who requires electricity due to special medical needs will be evacuated to a location with a generator. Based on your individual needs, you may be evacuated by Dare County Transportation or Dare County EMS. All areas in the county are included on the registry. Our Eric, staff stop that, uh, is from East. Thanks. That's a, a great program. Obviously, there's uh, some did some changes, and our EOC doesn't look like it does in the video anymore. We've made some improvements on that, but the special medical registry is still a, a great tool. It's still available to everybody. And there's a form. The link is there on the web on our my slides for uh, for you if you need it, but. Uh, Special Medical Registry is a great tool. Uh, next slide, please. This is the uh, Flood Inundation Mapping Alerting Network. You can get to this website off of the Get Ready, uh, I'm sorry, the readync.org website. But I show this to you because it does show all of the flood gauges that are across the state. But in coastal North Carolina, we now have gauges in Dare County from one at the Pheasant Center, one at Eskins Creek in Avon, one at uh, Marsh's Light in Maniel, and another one up on War Shore Road in Kitty Hawk that does show the actual water conditions in the sound. And, and why is that important? If you're able to see that the water is rising, it might give you an advance notice that it's time to move to the upper level of your home or maybe get on the roof if you've made that decision to shelter in place. Eric, if you can click it again, uh, not that you're gonna have to probably get to, there you go. This is some imagery from uh, what the what the gauges were doing at the Fedden Center as Dorian came by. You can see that they show the water levels dropping rapidly, and then you can see the water's level, level rising rapidly. So people that are able to see the gauges, if the internet's still working, you have access to them, you would be able to see that the water's going out into the sound, or you can see it coming back in, and that might uh, help you if you've made that decision to shelter in place and now uh, need to move to higher ground or do something uh, on, the, on the fly uh, to protect yourself. So next slide, Eric. I mentioned earlier about the Dare County Emergency Alerts. This will be just a, a quick video to show you how to sign up for those alerts if you haven't done that already. We do use these alerts to get information out to people. We also have the ability to use the integrated public alert warning system to send information out to cell phones. But this will, uh, it, don't rely on us getting to your cell phone. Please sign up for alerts as well and we can get information to you. 
Sorry, if you can play that video, please. To sign up for emergency alerts from Dare County Emergency Management, visit darenc.com slash emergency alerts. Examples of emergency alerts that may be sent include mandatory evacuation orders, re-entry information, hurricane bulletins, and countywide post-disaster information. Users will be asked to provide their name, phone number, and email address to create an account. When logged into the account, users will have the ability to pick how time-sensitive messages are received and which devices, phone numbers, and email addresses alerts are sent to. Emergency management officials also have the ability to send notifications to users based on address. Adding addresses will ensure users receive notification of situations that may impact those specific areas. Users also have the ability to opt in to receive weather alerts from the National Weather Service. For more information about the system, please visit darenc.com slash emergency alerts. Go to the next slide, Eric. I, I put this slide in here uh, to uh, let you all know we do have a campaign. It's love the beach, respect the ocean. Dot, and you can look at a lot of great information on that website. And people can sign to get uh, sign up to get text messages by sending join space OBX speech conditions 30890. That's very important to us all the time, but becomes even more important as we start to see storms come our way. Even if we don't get a land falling storm, we see the ocean conditions change quite rapidly and drastically with high threat of rip currents, long shore currents, shore break, all of those things. And uh, knowing what's going on in the ocean is important if you're gonna make that trip to the beach. So I, we got a lot of folks out here that are very, uh, keen on what goes on in the beach, but they may have visitors with them. Please share this information with your visitors that are coming and get them to sign up so they know what to do as they get ready to go to the beach, and uh, especially if we see a storm coming. Eric, next slide, please. We've also got another website that's available to everybody that talks about how to manage things in a COVID environment to do things safely, have fun, and, and effectively, and that's available there as well. And, we're going to be uh, practicing social distancing, whether they're at, at the beach, uh, throughout our community, well into this hurricane season and probably beyond. So just some more information available to you there. Uh, next slide, please, Eric. I uh, really uh, hope that you're leaving the, my portion of the conversation with a sense of urgency to get prepared, and and, and that really to know where you're going to go and how you're going to get there should an evacuation be ordered. Uh, there, these two videos are good. Uh, hopefully, they'll highlight uh, why I'm saying that because uh, storm surge is what's going to get people. Uh, we have a lot of people in our county that have lived through storm surge. So the personal experiences that they've uh, they've had as either the oceans come up or the sounds come up, and they've experienced in their backyards or in their homes. But we have new people here that may have just moved to Dare County that may be going, "What's that? What storm surge mean?" So I'm hoping these two simple videos uh, that are were developed by FEMA and the Weather Service uh, after Hurricane Michael made landfall down in Florida. Uh, one is don't be Tom, the other is be Debbie, and I'll just let them speak for themselves. So Eric, if you can please play don't be Tom. can't realize what your house is like when it starts flooding. Everything floats. You can't get down the hallway. I mean, you, you, got, you got to fight to get where you're going. The door was close. You can't hold it. I don't know how high this water is going to get. We're going to be trapped by grass in here. I saw Jeff outside that door. Eric, you can play that one. That'd be great. Thank you. When the word came out that there was mandatory evacuation, evacuated we might not be here if we had I just feel mom I don't think processed it yet Eric you can go to my last slide 
Well, thank you everybody for uh, listening. I know we got opportunity to get these questions online and put them in the chat in the question box, or we'll get the, the raised hands after Eric has the opportunity to take the floor. But I hope you leave my portion of your presentation with a sense of urgency to get your plans in place, get your kits put together, and then know where you're going to go should an evacuation be ordered. And the slide says it all, run from the water and hide from the wind. Storm surge is what takes life, lives. And I'm, I'm, Eric is gonna hit a little bit more on that. Thank you for your attention and thank you for joining us today. And Eric, the, the floor is yours. All right, Drew, really, really appreciate the presentation. That was excellent. We got a few questions in the chat box already. Dana asked about the presentation being available. We're working on trying to upload it through the software. There's actually a handout feature. I'm going to work on that in the background uh, after the Q&A session. Otherwise, we'll make sure um, you can get it. And we forgot to mention that this is being recorded. So if the technology works, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube page. Uh, which is NWS Moorhead City, and we'll have more on that in our presentation here in a second. So, and to add to that too, is uh, we'll be taking the video as well, the YouTube video, and our current TV channel up here and there is going to be posting that on current TV as well, so people can see it there. And we will make sure we get that those slides out there, everybody. But thanks, Eric, and I'm going to mute. No problem at all. Thanks, Drew. So again, if you're just joining us, uh, you saw Bruce uh, Drew's presentation. Um, this will be about another 20, 25 minutes, and then do not leave. We've got Liam and Andrew and James and Mike in the background taking your questions and then preparing them for the Q&A part at the end. So don't leave. This is intended to be a conversation, uh, so please stick around. The main point of this presentation is going to talk about hurricane preparedness. I'm really excited to share this because it's a new presentation. Uh, some of the slides, if you've seen our talks before, are going to be the same, but there's a lot of new information here. The time to prepare for hurricane season is now, and that's not to be alarmist. This would be the same thing as if I gave this talk in the middle of May, but we are getting into the peak of hurricane season. The peak is usually about September 10th. We've had experience with that with Hurricane Dorian and Florence being roughly around the peak itself. And this graphic just shows uh, when the uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones are most likely. So uh, the orange area are hurricanes and tropical storms, the yellow area are hurricanes. So again, ramps up about the middle part of September. Unfortunately, here in North Carolina, we can get storms any time of hurricane season. We've had them as early as May. So even though the season officially doesn't start until June 1st, we can get early season storms. And don't let our guard down. If we get to the middle of September and we think, oh, we, we made it through another hurricane season, we've had Matthew and Sandy that were uh, much later into October and November. So the time really is now, and that goes from May 1st right into the month of November. A good way to prepare is to use our website. This is a brand new website. The Weather Service has done a great job putting a lot of information together, but it was kind of all over the place. And a lot of it was uh, sent out during Hurricane Awareness Week in May. We kind of consolidated everything and put it on our website. It's Moorhead City, weather.gov slash Moorhead City, and then just Hurricane Prep. Everything you need to, to have. Drew mentioned know your zone, uh, having a plan. All of that information is on this website with graphics um, and information for you to share with family and friends. Please be a person that shares information. You might say, hey, I've lived 25 years on Hatteras Island. However, your neighbor may have just moved down to the area. Share that experience, share that information, and please use our website uh, to share with the community. On our website itself, we also have weather forecast information. Easy way to remember it. It's just weather.gov slash Moorhead City. At the bottom of the page, if you scroll down past the forecast part, there is a section called hazard briefings. If you click on that, you can get a briefing during severe weather. It's similar to what we send out to Drew. If you click on it today, there's nothing there because there's not a lot going on. But if we have a hurricane, severe weather, winter weather this coming winter, we will do a PDF document that's very, very detailed on what we expect. And again, that's on our website, the same website you might be familiar with, with your local forecast and information weather.gov slash Moorhead City. Please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and we use it different ways. 
Facebook and Twitter, we try to use to cut through the noise. Uh, we kind of wave our hands around and say, this is what you should be focusing in on. If you look at the tweet that we sent out prior to Florence, we talked about how the category of the storm was decreasing, but we wanted people to remember that has nothing to do with rainfall, how slow the storm is moving, how large the storm is moving. So we really use social media to make a concise message to the community. Speaking of a concise message, YouTube. This presentation will be on YouTube. We have other presentations of hurricane awareness on YouTube now. We take the briefings we do, uh, it's usually about five or 10 minutes, we'll verbally talk to local emergency managers like Drew, and we'll take that section and edit it, and we will put it on YouTube. So if you only have 30 seconds, it might not be your cup of tea. If you have five to 10 minutes in the day to really get an in-depth uh, report on what we expect, YouTube is a good place for those videos. We post them uh, during active periods of weather. So we threw a lot of information at you. Bottom line, weather.gov slash Moorhead City. Drew mentioned it, we mentioned it. There's a lot of people in the community interested in weather and everybody's trying to do their best. But please, if you take anything or at least one big thing from this talk, focus on official information. It's not that we're always the best, it's that we're the most concise and trusted source of information. Um, I see on the left, a lot of people uh, post this with the, the next storm that we uh, are watching for next week. Um, this is the spaghetti model plot. It has usefulness for a trained professional. So when we look at this, these are various possibilities. If you look at the laser uh, pointer, where they're clustered like this, that means higher confidence. Where they're spread out like that, it means lower confidence. With a trained professional explaining that, you understand that. With somebody posting it on the internet, your eye is going to be drawn to that one track that hits the outer banks, that one worst case scenario, and that's where it's not as useful. So please trust the official experts down at the Hurricane Center, 175 years of expertise. Again, they put in a lot of effort with the hurricane forecast track and they do a phenomenal job. If you need proof, here's some scientific evidence. If you've ever looked at the forecast cone, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but it's actually getting smaller. That's based on statistical analysis of error, and that error has improved. So we wanna go back to 1999, we had Hurricane Floyd, and this is showing the difference in three-day average error for the center of where the storm will go. So. Uh, Hurricane Floyd happened in 1999, and back then, three days out, this box or this circle represents where possible landfall would be based on our average error in 1999. So as I'm briefing Drew, in 1999, I was a second year student in college, so that wouldn't be happening, but I could only tell him that landfall in three days from Floyd was possible anywhere from the coastline of Georgia through all of South Carolina, North Carolina, and the Tidewater area of Virginia, huge area. Now, we go forward 20 years to Hurricane Dorian, that average error three days out would pinpoint a landfall somewhere near Cape Fear in North Carolina. Huge, huge improvement. So again, trust the experts. Um, you know, it's a very accurate forecast. Uh, we'll explain on the cone that there can be some errors. However, that trend in terms of forecast track has drastically improved. Now, where are we not doing well? We are not doing well with hurricane intensity. Uh, you've probably seen this before, especially as uh, hurricanes approach uh, landfall. This has happened a lot in the Gulf of Mexico. Sometimes they can quickly increase in strength. Three of our most powerful hurricanes before they made landfall, Andrew, the Labor Day storm in the 30s, and Camille, Three days prior to landfall, they were only tropical storms. So please keep that in mind. If we're watching a storm down toward the Bahamas, it's three days away. It's forecast to make landfall in the Outer Banks as a category one storm. We're gonna mention to de-emphasize the focus on the category because it doesn't capture everything a storm can produce and our intensity forecast still needs improvement. So that storm can strengthen rapidly into a three. So don't let your guard down with storms that are just a couple days away in terms of intensity. So kind of put that in the back of your head and vast improvement with the track forecast 
but we still have a ways to go with intensity, uh, and that's something we're certainly concerned with. So we talked about hurricane preparedness. Our website is a good way to start. Make your plan today. Is your hurricane kit ready? If you're like me with three younger kids and a wife, your hurricane kit is stocked with lots of snacks and goodies. Uh, then once you get through uh, hurricane season, you start to eat away at that kit. Then COVID happens and the kit is just destroyed. Uh, most of my snacks and non-perishables and stuff like that is just, you know, needs to be replenished. So make sure you check on your hurricane kit. Uh, make sure you revise that plan. Um, you know, if, if you don't intend to leave, still have a plan so that if you change your mind, you have that plan in place and you can uh, make a quick action. The next couple slides are going to go over some products that the Hurricane Center issues. You might say, Eric, you know, I've seen these before, but there may be some things that you're not aware of. Uh, one of the most favorite ones, especially early before a storm actually forms, is the Tropical Weather Outlook. Um, this will show potential development over the next five days. So in this example, it shows uh, current storms, but also where storms may form. And it'll give it a low, medium, or high chance of development um, over the next five days. So I like to look at this, especially for storms way out into the ocean, just our first heads up of, hey, you know, my plan is ready, but I could probably use a few more things in that hurricane kit, kind of a little kick in the butt to get going with things uh, by looking at the outlook. As we get closer, if the storm um, intensifies and, and gets a name or it's a, a potential cyclone, it will get, get a forecast track or forecast cone. This is easily the most popular item on the Hurricane Center website, and you see this from your local uh, TV media. It's a good forecast tool, but there are a few things to remember. Very, very scientific, this represents the most probable path for just the center of the storm. It does not show impacts. Nowhere on this graphic do you see that 30 inches of rain is going to fall. This is from Florence. Nowhere on here do you see anything about storm surge. Um, it doesn't really say too much about storm size either. This initial position down here, this orange shading and then a darker shading, that shows the initial wind radius of the storm, uh, but that can change as the storm uh, changes in intensity and structure. Uh, so this is only to show you the most probable path for the center of the storm. Two thirds of the time, it's gonna go somewhere in the cone. And you'll notice that the cone gets wider farther out in time. This is based on historical error. So at the end of each year, they'll redo the 24 hour, the 48 hour circle of error. And then that's how the path is actually created. It has nothing to do with the current storm itself. So if you're in near or anywhere in the general vicinity of the path, you should pay attention. It's, a, it's not a, I'm in it, I worry, I'm out, I don't worry. It's not that. If you're anywhere close, you should be paying attention. Because again, it's just the center. Impacts occur well away from the center. Point number two, although we've improved in forecasting, a third of the time we're going to be wrong and that center is going to go out of that forecast cone. It hasn't happened as much recently because I'm telling you, the men and women down at the Hurricane Center, outstanding. Uh, job with the forecast, but it's going to happen sometimes. So if you're anywhere in the general vicinity of the path, you should be paying attention. So please don't take it as I don't have to worry unless I'm in the path. Some newer graphics that have come out a couple of years ago, the earliest uh, reasonable time of arrival of uh, tropical storm force winds. Uh, this is a good worst case scenario. If you have your plans done by this time, you're okay. This is uh, the 10% chance, again, a worst case scenario of when the, the storm may arrive. And although it has specific times on here, we still like to be general to show that uncertainty. So instead of Wednesday at eight o'clock, this is Florence hitting the Outer Banks, we would say something like sometime late Wednesday or early Thursday. The most likely time of uh, tropical storm force winds, that's when we expect the, the winds to pick up. Um, and again, be generic with the times. In this case, this is Arthur. Uh, we had a storm earlier in the year. Uh, this would be sometime Monday morning. And again, it's a good tool. The worst case uh, tool is if you prepare by then, you'll be okay. And then the most likely is when we do think winds will pick up. And we don't just pick those tropical storm force out winds because we want to. That's roughly when things start shutting down and when it's unsafe to be on the roads. So a lot of evacuations uh, and timing are planned on that threshold 
for tropical storm force winds. So we've done a lot of wind talking. Raise your hand virtually from home. Who's heard of the Saffir Simpson scale? Keep the hand up if you've heard, I'm not going to. I'm not going to leave unless it's a three. I'm not going to leave unless it's a four. The Saffir Simpson scale is important, but it's only related to wind speed. It does not say anything about storm surge. It does not say anything that the storm is hundreds of miles wide or where the storm is going to hit. It is only related to wind speed. It's part of the puzzle, but not the whole puzzle. I'm not saying ignore if it says four or five. Hey, Eric said, don't worry about the Saffir Simpson scale. What Eric is saying is it's only part of the puzzle you should be focusing in on. You should not be making your decisions based on just a category of the storm. You should make your decisions on all of the impacts and your local evacuations uh, for where you live. It is all about the impacts. Uh, so I really want you to get this point. Since 2010, we've had a lot of just category ones. 175 direct deaths and over $100 billion in damage. Do you rem rem uh, remember storms like Irene? How about um, Matthew, Hermine, Florence, Dorian? Again, just category ones. Categories only related to wind, so please focus on all of the impacts. So we're going to talk about this kind of in reverse order in terms of what causes the most death and issues down to the ones that don't cause as many issues. Uh, water, 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 it's all about the water, whether it's rainfall flooding, storm surge, or rip currents. Wind is important, and also tornadoes. So we mentioned this before, water is what kills. Uh, this is an older graphic, it goes through 2012, but the point is, 90% of deaths from 1963 to 2012 were water related. A lot of it, about half were storm surge. Drew mentioned that with the video. About a third is rainfall flooding, but also uh, things in the surf uh, like rip currents uh, can lead to deaths as well. If you squint or you look really, really close, wind is less than 10%. It's not to ignore wind, but if you're sheltering inside, you're relatively safe. Uh, from, from the wind itself. Can you have a fallen tree? Yes, but water is the big issue. You might say, well, Eric, that's just through 2012. Haven't we made a lot of uh, leaps and bounds with our efforts? We have, but unfortunately, from 2016 to 2018, 83% of our deaths were still water related. So we're still losing a lot of people. Where we made uh, the biggest progress the last couple of years is, is storm surge. Um, there's new products, storm surge watches and warnings, which we're going to show you. We haven't have a, had a lot, a lot of loss of life uh, with storm surge related deaths, but unfortunately, we still have a lot of deaths related to water. Specifically, it's with folks and vehicles. So during the last couple seasons, more than half are vehicle related deaths. These are very preventable deaths. This is not that gentleman talking about storm surge in his house where the water comes up suddenly. This is you've evacuated, you're coming back home and you go around that barrier. This is the storm is occurring and you go out in the storm. This is the storm has passed and it's sunny out and you venture out and there's a flooded road and you decide to cross it. This is preventable deaths uh, that are occurring. Again, most occurring in automobiles. Hurricane Florence really highlights that. Uh, this is a five day rainfall forecast, five days out. Um, this was the forecast of rainfall, you know, uh, 15 to 30 inches of rain. On the right is observe what happened. We as meteorologists are always going to strive to continue to improve, and we will continue to make improvements. Where we're putting more effort in is that communication aspect. If we had that accurate of a forecast, why are our people uh, still losing their lives? 16 of the 17 uh, flood-related fatalities uh, with, uh, with Florence were uh, flood-related. Um, and they were uh, in vehicles. So again, the example, this is from Matthew. This is an inland location. This applies the same for the Outer Banks. You see water, um, it could be you know, flowing fast. It can easily pick up a vehicle, but what you don't know is what is below the water? Is the road there? Is it washed out? Especially at nighttime, there's a lot of danger that you may be unaware of more than just the flowing water itself. It could be the, the roads are no longer there. So our big campaign with that is turn around, don't drown. Again, take this very serious, especially during and after the storm, 
Unfortunately, that's where we're losing a lot of our lives. Some products we issue, you're probably familiar with flash flood warnings and watches. One I want you to be aware of is a flash flood emergency. Uh, this will alert on your phone. Uh, it's a wireless emergency alert. Um, you'll get this. And we issue these when it is actively really, really bad. Catastrophic flooding, we would confirm it with Drew. You should already be home, but this is another reminder. Hey, stay home, stay put, get to a higher level in your home if you if you need to. Um, this is you know catastrophic, something that you don't see very often uh, outside of maybe a, a tropical system like Florence. All right, so we talked a lot about uh, freshwater flooding. Uh, the other one we have to concern ourselves with, uh, of course, is storm surge. Um, eight to 11 feet of inundation we had in New Bern, uh, down in uh, just to the southwest of you all. We had 1,800 water rescues, and that example is from the four to seven feet of storm surge uh, that we had with Dorian on Ocracoke and Hatters Island. So storm surge is a rapid rise of water, so it can catch people off guard. And unfortunately, we've had the experience here with all that sound water getting pushed to the west it can slosh back and it will slosh back and uh, produce a rapid rise of water like we saw with Dorian. So that's certainly a concern uh, with any uh, tropical system itself. So a couple of years ago, we started issuing um, with the Hurricane Center, the storm surge watches and warnings. These are issued for life-threatening inundation of three feet or greater above normally dry ground. What does that mean, area, Eric? Low-lying areas near the sound, the ocean, wherever there's water that are usually dry, you could have up to three feet or more of water in those areas. So we'll issue those watches and warnings for that. You may be familiar with these maps. You can only zoom in enough. Uh, they're on our website. They're in our briefings. Uh, this is the worst case scenario, potential storm surge uh, flooding. When you see these, uh, this is showing it's a reasonable worst case that somewhere in this area could see three, six, nine feet of storm surge inundation. Uh, the reason we don't zoom in anymore is uh, the accuracy is not there yet, so that's why they're kind of a little bit wider out. They're hard to see unless you're on a mobile device or a computer where you can zoom in. They're not the best for social media and our TV partners. So starting this year, there's an experimental peak storm surge graphic. Uh, this is more 30,000 foot level to show the Pamlico sound and the ocean, Albemarle sound, things like this, uh, what we expect in terms of storm surge. It's the same information, but just on a more social media and overall media friendly graphic for you to use. So how many of you remember Hurricane Lorenzo in 2019? You might say, Lorenzo, I, re I remember Dorian, but I don't remember Lorenzo. It was the northernmost Category 5 storm on record in the Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately, it caused eight rip current related deaths from Florida up to Rhode Island. Uh, we had one on the Outer Banks as well, um, and that in in includes four deaths total in North Carolina. So rip currents are an impact. This might be uh, one of the impacts we see from the, the potential storm next week. As early as Friday or this weekend, seeing a rip currents from that swell from a distant hurricane, one that doesn't even hit us, we can be impacted with the rip current threat. We do issue forecasts for rip currents. Uh, this is an example for Arthur during our briefing, directing people to the rip current page. The best way to uh, fight a rip current is to stay out of the water. If we have a high risk, you don't wanna be in the water at all. I have signed up for the OBX alerts, so I get those rip current forecasts every day on my phone. Um, from the, the folks up at Dare County at 8.30 in the morning. So stay out of the water. If you're in the water and you get caught in one, again, swim parallel, float, don't fight it, uh, swim left to right, however you want to remember it. Once you're out of that narrow stream, then you can swim back towards shoreline. I mentioned earlier our social media. Uh, we've been really trying to message this heavily on social media. Uh, a lot of folks from up north um, they know, you know, the beach locations, not as much as the cities. So we're trying to put uh, more cities and beaches on this map. And this is just an example of, um, you know, a rip current forecast, um, trying to highlight the threat for rip currents itself. All right, so we talked a lot about water, storm surge, inland flooding or heavy rainfall. Uh, we talked about rip currents. Winds are important. Uh, these are peak winds from Hurricane Florence. This is from my neighborhood. 
Uh, luckily, not my house. We did have some damage, but I want you to point out that you know this house is well boarded up, but they tr suffered a tremendous loss of roof shingles because of the consistent wind. Florence wasn't really about the peak wind speed. It was more about the three and four day duration. So you can have issues with communication, blocked evacuation routes, and fallen trees. So winds are certainly to be uh, taken uh, seriously. I do want to compare and contrast the category aspect to really hammer home. Don't just focus on category, focus on all the impacts. And that also includes the storm movement and how large it is. So uh, virtual raise hand, you know, who remembers Arthur in 2014? A lot of you probably do in the Outer Banks, um, not as much inland. It was a category, tor uh, category two storm, made landfall near Cape Lookout, uh, but it was fast moving in a smaller storm. So I know you had some surge issues even up on the northern Outer Banks with that track uh, abruptly moving to the northeast. You had that slosh effect on the sound side, and you did have some uh, issues on Highway 12, and you had some wind speeds 80 to, 80 to 100 miles per hour. But overall, for the whole area, Arthur was not a huge impact for us. Again, outside of the Outer Banks, 20 to 30 mile per hour winds, a couple inches of rain, not, not as notable. Do you remember Irene? You know, before you say, wait a second, you know, we had impacts with Arthur. You did, but you had major impacts with Irene, and that was just a one. But it was slower moving, and it was a much, much larger storm. And no trick here, again, it was similar landfall near Cape Lookout. So please focus on all the impacts. Yes, category is important. It's just part of the puzzle. And we're going to tell you these things. This is a slow moving storm. This is a large storm. We're really concerned with surge on the sound side as the storm departs. So you don't have to decipher it. We're going to point it out. Uh, but please have an open mind and listen to all of it. We're just about done, so we're going to focus on um, one of the last threats, which could be one of the first threats with the landfalling or approaching a tropical cyclone. That's tornadoes. Uh, this image is from D Dorian last year with COVID and everything going on. I just cannot believe we're coming up on the one year anniversary. It seems like it was five years ago. Uh, we had an EF2 tornado down in Emerald Isle. The important thing to point out about this, it really highlights two things. Number one, Tornadoes can and will produce isolated areas of damage. So overall, we didn't have a lot of impact down our way from wind. But on Emerald Isle, if you lived over here, you certainly had an impact. Number two, they can and will occur well away from the storm itself. This was either, if not the first, it was one of the first bands, one of those outer bands coming on shore when we had the tornado. We got the warning out, but usually you don't have a, a huge window to react because they're quick spin-ups. Uh, what we mean by that is they, they touch down really quick and then they lift back up into the cloud. So please have multiple ways to get warnings. If you're staying, um, you know, Tropical Storm Hermine, we had, we had tornadoes on the Outer Banks. So if you're going to stay, if it's even just a tropical storm or low end uh, category storm, the tornado threat is certainly there. This really highlights it with Florence. Again, landfall was down toward uh, Wrightsville Beach. I think this is quite remarkable. We had tornadoes all the way up to the suburbs and in and, in, on, and also near Richmond, Virginia. So again, landfall down here, tornado threat all across Eastern North Carolina and Southern Virginia. So lots of threats to consider, storm surge, heavy rainfall, rip currents, tornado and wind. So five when you're thinking about hurricanes. So that is enough of Drew and I talking, right Drew? So uh, we're gonna turn it over to you. Um, before we do a couple housekeeping items, again, while you're asking some questions, I'm gonna try to sneak that presentation into the handout section. At the very least, everything seems to be recording okay. So I anticipate that we'll put this on YouTube here later today, and we'll post that link um, for folks um, that signed up. In fact, Drew, everybody that signed up for this presentation, we have your email, so we could easily correspond with you uh, with regards to the presentation and the recording. If you have any direct questions for the Weather Service, my email is at the bottom. We are here 24 seven. I'm actually in the office today, but most days I'm at home, but our service has not changed. Uh, we work with Drew just like we did before. The difference is I'm not, I'm not driving up there. If you need us for anything, you need some rip current brochures for your rental agency, you need a talk for your lo local HOA. We, you love this talk and you want us to give a talk reach out to us. We can do it through this software 
uh, we're nothing is different on our, on our end in terms of service. So uh, please don't forget that. So at this time, um, Andrew and Liam and Mike, you can join us and James, um, if you're not camera shy, you can pop on the camera if you want. Uh, they're going to field us some questions. I'm kind of looking at some of them now. Um, and if we don't get a lot of questions, uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up. But just to reiterate, the two ways you can do it, um, you can ask through the webinar itself. Um, you can ask the question and we'll get that directly. And if you want to ask a verbal question, just raise your hand. We're going to call on you to give you a heads up. Uh, we're going to unmute your mic and just make sure you don't remute it because then we don't have control over it and then ask your question. If you accidentally raised your hand, if somebody already answered your question, just lower your hand so that we don't accidentally call on you. So I'm gonna hop out of this and then turn it over um, to any questions that we have. And just bear with us as we get this set up. And I'm gonna um, turn the presentation off so that it's not, let's see, stop showing the screen. Okay, so it should just be us on camera, folks. All right, so Liam and An Andrew, um, you, we could go back and forth. Uh, Andrew, Liam, you can ask them, and then James, if you want to um, pipe in, that's fine as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I can start off uh, with one of the questions we had written in. Uh, Hervac used to show wind swath forecasts. Is this available to supplement the forecast cone? I'm not as familiar with that, Drew. Do you know? Do you know that one? Because we don't. I don't use Hervac. Hervac uh, transitioned to online re over the past couple of years. Um, whoever's asking the question, I, just give me a phone, give me a call, and I'll chat with you about it. I don't have the direct answer right now. But I'll have to get into the system and walk through it. But just 252-475-5897, uh, 252-475-5897, and I'll be able to try to get that answer for you on Hervac. All right, it looks like we have another question about, um, this might be a good question for Eric. It says, if I'm able to evacuate earlier than required, are there any factors such as the direction the hurricane is coming from that might indicate where I should evacuate to? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. So I've got, um, talking about the plan that Drew mentioned, I've got two plans. Uh, I've got in-laws and family in South Carolina, and then I grew up in Maryland, just south of Baltimore. So yay to, to Maryland, anybody logged up from Maryland. So I have two plans. I have a northern plan and a southern plan. And just depending on where the storm comes, um, I'll send them in one direction or the other. So I would focus on you know what the county is saying and then the track itself. Uh, whatever puts you the farthest away and most comfortable is the plan that I go with. Uh, so the least amount of driving for my family and the farthest away. So if we have one that's just glancing by us uh, and it's not going to go inland like Florence, I'll send my family down to South Carolina. Um, if it's going to be bad like Florence and, you know, it's going to be bad everywhere, they're going to have issues getting back. Um, you know, kids, uh, you know, no power for a couple of days is certainly a challenge. Uh, so I'll send them as far away as I can and I'll send them up, up to Maryland. So I would say pay attention to the track and what the county officials are saying, but I would have two spots to go to if you can, and kind of opposite of each other. I'll, I'll just add to that too, Erica. You know, the Weather Service is a national, nationwide. Check that Weather Service forecast for where you might be going to, and really take a look at what the products they're putting out, whether it's in Raleigh or, or in Charlottesville or wherever it might be. Go and look at that forecast for where you're thinking about going. That could really give you some insights as to what might be taking place when you get there. Uh, not just our local forecast, but look at those other forecast products that are out there. I will bring up a question that was asked earlier that I responded to in, in writing, but it's a great question and one I'd like to share with the group, our audience that we still have. Uh, someone asked, will COVID-19 impact how the county responds to severe weather situations, evacuations, and reentry? And really just to echo on what Drew spoke to earlier, the main um, consequence we see you know, dealing with a hurricane in a pandemic environment is going to have to do with evacuation. So really stressing that having your plan in place, you know, in my plan, uh, you know, depending on the track of the storm, like what we talked about earlier, is go, go to some friends. I also have some family in the western part of the state. But if, if that was part of my plan before, and now if I'm planning on staying with someone who's uh, at risk or really anyone, you know, reach out to them ahead of time and say, hey, look, it's, it's, it's 
it's, it's hurricane season. You know, we may or may not get a storm, but is it still okay that I bring my my my, my wife and my kids and my dog to come stay with you? You know, and, and if they have any concerns about that, now is the time to have that discussion, not when that storm is imminent. If you if you're planning on staying at a hotel, you know, try to have those reservations made before you depart. And like Drew said, shelters should only be used as a last resort. The shelter environment, that's where the, the impacts of the COVID environment are really going to be seen between having to wear a mask the whole time you're in there, the social distancing, the meals might be completely different. So if that's part of your plan, I'm encourage you not to have that part of your plan, but if, that, if that's there as a last resort, plan on that being different. So I just want to share that with the group in response to that question that was asked earlier. And I'll just add to James's comment, it's uh, have that plan. And for those people that are unable to have that plan because they, they don't have the means, they don't have the ability to transport themselves, we're still going to have the ability to get them where they need to be. And that's going to be someplace safe. We'll get them taken care of. We, our transportation system, our social service staff, we'll get that information out should they need it. But uh, if they have the plan, it's the best thing. But uh, we'll still have a, a backup plan for those that have their plans fall through. And that, that backup plan should be, i to find a second back place to go, as Jane said, uh, and then that third one would be the shelter. Uh, we had another question come in, uh, and it's asking why is Ocracoke Island in a different zone than Hatteras? I'll uh, share, I'll answer that one. But since uh, Ocracoke is in Hyde County, uh, Ocracoke has their their zones, Hyde County has their zones as well. I believe they have three. I believe Ocracoke is their zone A, similar to our zone A for Hatteras. And then they have mainland and they have another zone in, in, in Hyde County. But it's purely because Ocracoke is in Hyde County and their decisions are made based on the leadership in Hyde County, where ours are based on leadership here in Bear County. But um, we have historically seen Ocracoke and Hyde come back late at the, about the same time as we're doing Hatteras, but it's it's the difference between the two counties. I don't uh, see any more questions right now. We'll we'll pause one more second and just to remind folks if they want to ask a verbal question, just do the raise hand feature and then we'll unmute your mic um, while we wait for any possible more questions to come in. And if not, we'll wrap things up. Just some housekeeping. Um, I haven't been able to, to uh, step aside to sneak it into the handout, but this software is awesome. So we have all your email addresses, so it really doesn't matter. I'll send you the PDF, and then when the recording's done, I'll send you the link to YouTube so that you have all that right away. And as Drew mentioned, they're gonna rebroadcast it as well. It might look a little uh, fancier, chopped up, um, but uh, we'll get that out to you probably later today. It takes, takes a little while to render, but uh, we'll make sure the email you registered with if you don't get it and you're hearing me now and a day or two passes by and you say, where is where is it? There is a chance you signed up and you missed a character with your email. So so reach out to me because um, it because I just go by the spreadsheet. Whatever you input it in for your email is what we're going to go with. You can ask this one, Liam, that last question from Mr. Jim. Yeah, uh, we had somebody ask about uh, repeating information about the Ready North Carolina, the old app. Sure, I'll, I'll take care of that. The Ready NC mobile app that had been in place for several years has been discontinued by the state. It is no longer an effective app. It may still open up on your phone and be there, but it's not going to give you the information you are looking for. What you need to do is to go to the readync.org website and bookmark that, which Eric just brought up, bookmark that on your mobile device. And all of the information that used to be in the mobile app is available from the website in a mobile version. So it's a, they've decommissioned the ReadyNC mobile app and have transitioned to a mobile website that has that same information in it. Hopefully that answers your question. We actually had another, another quick question come in. Uh, what are your thoughts about generators for non-full-time and non-rental properties? Well, if, if you're asking my thoughts about having a generator, uh, I have one at my home. I, I, my wife will evacuate. Uh, 
we have a generator because we decided to have a generator at our home. I, uh, I would hope that having a generator wouldn't sway your decision to stay or go. Uh, the, you know, the evacuation order is is uh, there to, to get you to go. Having a generator is you know nice to have to keep things in your uh, when you need to get your house back up and running. Uh, I think when you look at some of the uh, information that's available to you uh, about getting ready to evacuate and taking care of your home, it encourages you to turn off the gas, it, turn off the electrical power to the home. So that should power be lost, there, there could be electrical challenges or fire challenges, but you know, having a generator for a home is a, a decision that people need to make. And I just hope it wouldn't be the, I think you can weather the storm better just because you have a generator. And if I could add to that, I would just say that if you do have a generator, make sure that you're familiar with it, especially from a safety perspective. Um, you know, we, we, we do sometimes see reports in, in the aftermath of a storm that people have harm themselves or harmed others in the form of backfeeding a power line and the line workers are out there trying to restore power. So I would say if you do uh, make the jump to, to have a generator, again, it's a great thing to have, but make sure that you're well versed in, in, in how to operate it uh, properly and especially safety, safely for yourself and everyone else out there. And if it is a small portable generator, make sure it's running outside, not in the garage. Yeah, carbon monoxide kills too. All right, everybody. Um, Mike, Andrew, and Liam, and James, thank you. I don't see any more questions, and I don't see any uh, hands raised, uh, so we're going to um, wrap this up. I appreciate everybody joining us. If there's a question that, that you missed, you have Drew's contact as, as you do mine. Uh, you'll get an email from me, so I can also put you in touch with them if you missed any part. Uh, we mentioned weather.gov slash Moorhead City slash Hurricane Prep. Everything you need, stuff Drew talked about, having a plan, Know Your Zone, that's all on that website. Uh, so please take a look at it uh, when you can. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Drew, um, Andrew, and Liam, and James, and Mike. Thanks for fueling the questions. Did you want to say anything else, uh, Drew, as we wrap up? Uh, just to thank you, Eric, and the entire weather service team from the folks in D.C. to the folks in Miami, but most importantly, to our great partners down there in Newport, Moorhead City. Uh, you know, we know that you're always there for us and bringing information to our residents is and our visitors, whoever might be on, is critical uh, before a storm, during a storm, and after. But thank you for doing it. It's a great piece of uh, technology you shared with us. And if there is anybody still on as participants, thank you for joining us. And, and if you learned something, share with a neighbor. Talk to your neighbors. Let them know what, what you learned. If you, if you heard a repetitive piece, uh, share it again, because it's still important uh, to get that message to everybody who, who needs it, uh, to get that plan in place, get their kids prepared, and to be ready to know where to go should we have an evacuation this year. Thank you all for joining us. All right, you'll see a copy of the presentation, uh, both the audio recording and the, uh, the PDF here uh, later today. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Eric.